Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship with the Tierra Santa Church family on another shut-in, sheltered-in, socially distanced day during this uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. We're glad that you're able to join us today. Thank you so much for making us part of your day, part of your Sabbath worship experience. I hope that you're doing okay, that you've had a, a decent week. Uh, I'd like to sing a couple of songs with you and for you that are in the Seventh-day Adventist Church hymnal. These are wonderful songs of faith and hope. Uh, they are number 523 and 522 in the church hymnal. And I find these to be two of the great, great songs of the church over the years. The first one I'd like to sing is My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. It's number 523. It's just a wonderful song about finding rest in Christ and not in anything else. Uh, it's enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. So I'll just sing a couple of stanzas of this. My faith has found a resting place not in a man-made creed. I trust the ever-living one that he for me will plead. I need no other evidence. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. The great physician heals the sick, the lost he came to save. For me his precious blood he shed, for me his life he gave. I need no other evidence, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and rose again for me. And a companion song right across the page, number 522 in our church hymnal, is entitled, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less Than Jesus' Blood and Righteousness. Another great, great hymn of the church. Most church hymnals, no matter what the denomination, uh, have these hymns in it. And uh, they're wonderful songs to sing, to think about, especially the words. So I'd like to sing a couple of stanzas of My Hope is Built on nothing less. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come, sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground. We 
we're calling these little uh, get-togethers on Sabbath morning during the coronavirus crisis, we're calling them uh, fireside chat times or fireside chat sermons because we're doing it in the McCary living room beside a fire. Last week the fire went out and none of you told me it did and so it was just lying there dormant. Uh, but uh, the fire is roaring right now. And I'll just have a little drink of water to kind of uh, help my parched throat uh, during this time. But um, I just hope that by singing these hymns and playing these hymns, it's meaningful to you, that it means something to you, uh, that, uh, that the words uh, touch your soul, touch your life, because uh, it is really important that we have poetry, prose, poems, something that we can, can grab onto that makes our life more meaningful during times when it seems like there is no meaning. Sometimes we feel so empty and alone, uh, especially if you are stuck at home alone with not a lot of family around you. It can be quite difficult, and I understand that. And uh, so I want you to feel as if, if you uh, have a friend with you, not just Jesus, but me and all of the other people who are here. Uh, let's sing uh, Amazing Grace together. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now blind, but now I see. When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Well, let's make our way over to my easy chair and uh, have a little family home time with all of us. You're probably sitting in your easy chair or uh, in a comfortable place near your uh, computer. And uh, I just want you to feel as if it's relaxing, it's comfortable, you're at ease, there's no pressure. Everything is fine. Last week, I uh, started to do something that I want to do every week, and that is to let you know that I'm thinking about you. And I'm doing this by using the Romper Room Magic Mirror theme. Many of you will remember the TV show Romper Room back in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. Some of you may have seen it in the 80s. And at the end of the show, uh, the lady would take a mirror, and she would call it a magic mirror. And she would look into that mirror, and that mirror, of course, had a hole right through it where she could look into the camera. And as you looked into her eyes, she would begin to say the names of the children that she could see out there in the television audience. So I'm going to metaphorically hold up my magic mirror here and tell you who I see today. I see Bill and Susan 
and Ethan. I see Les and Jean and Louie and Beth. I see Rochelle and Barbara and Carla and Annika and Ava. I see Willie and Betty and Bob and Carmen and Kanan and Gigi. I see Chris and Taylor and Olivia and Sienna. I see LJ and Natalie and Isis and Dave and Cindy and Herman and Mary. I see Will and Hanalore, James and Debbie and Laura. I see Dwayne and Dana and Milt and Carol and Peter. I see Shirley and Aurora and Samaj and Jemsa. And if I didn't say your name today or last week, you listen next week because I may see you as I'm looking right into my magic mirror camera. So before we have our, uh, our uh, sermon for today, let me just mention, in case you hadn't heard, that we have a couple of people in our congregation who are battling cancer and aggressive cancer and having to undergo chemotherapy treatments. And, and they are Janice McMillan and Eunice Horn. Please continue to remember them in prayer as they're going through a very difficult time right now. And remember their families because it's not easy uh, for them also. Please continue to remember Mary Betts and Mary Proctor Dane who deal with uh, the physical issues every day that are quite painful uh, and pray for them continually. It does us all good to know that we are prayed for and I appreciate the prayers that you have for me. And so uh, before we have our sermon, let us bow our heads together for a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Parent, we thank you for the privilege of talking to you every minute of every day. But together, as a, as a worshiping community of faith, we come to you this morning asking you for your guidance and your wisdom. We pray for all the people in our lives, in our orb, in our circle, and outside of our circle who we know, who we love, and we want to pray for them. And so we lift them to you in prayer today. And I pray that as we open your word, we will come to new insights, meaningful insights. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm titling this sermon, The Ministry of the Risen Lord. And I would like to begin by quoting Mark chapter 16 and verse 19. He says, After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. This is at the end of Mark's gospel. Mark and Luke both record Jesus rising up and ascending to heaven. Matthew and John don't mention it. Their gospels end in a completely different way. But Mark, the earliest gospel, and Luke record that. Mark suggests that it happened actually uh, within a day or two after the resurrection. Luke suggests that it happened about 40 days after. It's not worth quibbling about. The important thing is they both mention that Jesus ascended into heaven. I want to ask you the question, what has Jesus been doing for the last 2,000 years? What do you think occupies his time? Has he been visiting other inhabited worlds? Has he in been investigating the life record of every person who's ever lived? Has he been taking long walks with Moses and Elijah and Enoch and any other humans who might be in heaven right now? What in the world has Jesus been doing? And what does he do still today? And what does the Father do? Does the Father, God the Father, do the same things as Jesus? When we talk about the Trinity, when one does one thing, is the other one doing exactly the same thing at the same time, or are they separate? These are all questions that have been 
uh, perplexing theologians and scholars for years and years and years. But we are at the end of our series today on the life of Jesus. And I want to talk about his post-resurrection life in the heavenly realms. What is Jesus up to? And so I've titled the sermon, The Ministry of the Risen Lord. This series has gone on for many, many weeks. Those of you who've been along for the ride know it. We started out looking at the pre-existence of Jesus and the evidence from the Bible of Christ's pre-existence. We talked about his strange, somewhat miraculous birth, about uh, his parents, of his early childhood. There's not a lot in scripture about what occurred in his life from the time he's born until he's roughly 30 years of age. So we had to do a lot of speculation, but you can look at biblical texts and you can look at the aura of the day in which he lived and the place in which he lived, which is the region of Galilee. And you can come to some conclusions. It appears that his father, for example, was a carpenter and that Jesus probably took up the family business, uh, learned from his dad, and chances are his father passed away before Jesus was 20 years of age. We don't know that for sure. The evidence seems to suggest that. And then Jesus probably helped support the family in his own carpenter's shop. We looked at Jesus' baptism, his relationship with John the Baptist, and what a profound influence John had on Jesus' early life. Uh, it is only after John the Baptist is imprisoned that Jesus thinks seriously about what he's going to do and decides on his life's mission. Uh, the imprisonment of John the Baptist had a profound effect on Jesus. As you'll recall, John was a, uh, an apocalyptic firebrand, talking about the end of the world and how uh, this coming Messiah was going to separate the chaff from the wheat. He was going to, to uh, clear the threshing floor. It was all very apocalyptic, very end-of-time language. Jesus, I think, gave that a lot of serious thought. And after John's imprisonment, Jesus determines to do what he had set out to do originally, and that is to preach a little bit different message, not focusing on the end of the world or on the apocalypse, but focusing on the real life here and now of people's lives, the kingdom of God, which he suggests is among you, here, now, within you, and at hand. All of those terms seem to indicate it's present. It's right now. So we looked at Jesus as he becomes popular. We called him a superstar, perhaps the first great superstar in human history. Uh, Jesus, the miracle worker. Uh, what Jesus' per personality was like. Uh, we, so we looked, looked over many weeks at Jesus' persona. And then we finally got to the last week of Jesus' life. We took a look at, at that last week, beginning with Palm Sunday and the triumphal entry, his cleansing the temple, uh, his relationship with his disciples during that week, and then, of course, his uh, Last Supper, his death, and his resurrection. So what is Jesus doing now? What has he been doing since his ascension to heaven? I'd like to suggest, based on scripture, that Jesus has a ministry that he is ministering in conjunction with us. So what is the ministry of the risen Lord? And where do we fit in? Many portions of the New Testament and of the Bible as a whole, but particularly the New Testament, they ask us to use our imagination. They demand that we imaginatively interpret things metaphorically. The word metaphor comes from a Latin and Greek word that means to transfer. A metaphor is a word or a phrase used to describe something as if it were something else. It's a figure of speech. For example, if I say to you that my sister is the black sheep of the family, 
I'm telling you something about my sister, but I'm using the metaphor of the black sheep. My sister is not a black sheep, but if my sister were somebody who was a real rascal and who was always getting in trouble and who people looked down upon, you might say that she's the black sheep of the family. Or to say that uh, it's a jungle out there, talking about when you go outside your doors and, and, and get the rat race of the world uh, become immersed in that. You say it's a jungle. Well, it's not a real jungle, but you know it's a metaphor. It's a, a figure of speech. If you say my life has been a roller coaster, the ups and downs of life, figure of speech. Or, for example, uh, she has a heart of gold. Well, her heart really isn't gold, but you know what we mean when we say that a person has a heart of gold. Much of the New Testament uses language that sounds metaphorical and is probably intended to be metaphorical. For example, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Well, you're not salt, literally, and you're not light, like a light bulb, literally. But you know what he means when he says that. In the Old Testament, in many of the Psalms, the Lord is my rock and my fortress. You know what those images mean. Or how about he sat down at the right hand of God? I'd like to suggest that these are metaphors that mean something and should mean something to us. So what is Jesus doing now and what can we learn from the metaphors of the New Testament? The book of Hebrews is filled with metaphorical language from beginning to end. But I'd like to read to you, to begin with, the first three verses of Hebrews. Many of you know these passages of Scripture very well, but I want to remind you and suggest that there are metaphors here that are important for us to grasp. Here's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the past... God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. All right, the author is telling us that God has, through many different ways, communicated with human beings throughout the centuries. But recently, the author of Hebrews says, in these last days, he has spoken to us directly by his son, who is the exact representation of his being. The Son is as close to what God is like as you'll ever see on earth. And then he says, after he had provided purification for sins. In other words, he took care of the sin problem. What is that sin problem? It's different for each of us. If you feel or have felt in your life separated from God, that's a problem. That's a sin problem. Jesus solved that problem. And then the author of Hebrews says, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. The majesty in heaven, a reference to God the Father. The right hand on his best side. The right and the left are important places to sit right next to God, but the right hand is the top place. It's a metaphor for the most important place right next to God. To sit down is a metaphor for something. Jesus solved the sin problem between God and us. And to illustrate that this problem was solved once and for all, Jesus is described as sitting down right here in the first chapter and no fewer than four times in the book of Hebrews. In chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. The point of what we are saying is this, says the author. 
we do have such a high priest, that's Jesus, who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Again, he sat down. In chapter 10 and verse 12, the author says, But when this priest, that is Jesus, when he had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In chapter 12 and verse 2, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, says the author. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Four times in the book of Hebrews, the author of that majestic letter says that Jesus, our high priest, sat down at the right hand of of God. It's a, it's a way, it's a metaphor, it's a way of saying his work was completed. He didn't need to stand up anymore. He could sit down and he sat down at the right hand of God. The author of Hebrews isn't the only one who talks about sitting down. As we already mentioned, Mark mentions it, that when Jesus ascended to heaven, he sat down at God's right hand. And Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 Verses 19 to 23 says this. God's power is his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realm. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The church is his body, metaphor. Paul believes that the church is in some sort of um, metaphysical sense. Metaphysical meaning extra physical, outside of physical. Some sort of sense, the church is Christ's body. And furthermore, he writes that that body is the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So the fullness of him who fills everything is his body, and his body is the church. That helps to explain what Paul writes in the very next chapter of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 6. He says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realm. He is suggesting that when Jesus sat down at the right hand of God, we sat down at the right hand of God because we are his body. Do you see the metaphor? Do you see the meaning? What Jesus does, we do. What we do, Jesus does. This doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't exist, but it, it doesn't let Jesus just be an artifact of the past. He's not somebody who just lived 2,000 years ago. He is present today in the church, which is his body. What we do, Jesus does, and what Jesus does, we do. The New Testament gives other hints as to the ministry of the risen Christ. The author of Hebrews uses constant metaphorical language as he likens the entire sanctuary and sacrificial service of the Jewish people. He likens it to Christ. Jesus is the lamb, he says. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the curtain between the holy place and the most holy place. Jesus is the tabernacle, and so on and so forth. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, the author says, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. It's high priestly language, but it's also legal language, the metaphor of legality. He is our intercessor. He is our 
advocate. But since what he does, we do, then you and I are intercessors. We are advocates as servants of Jesus. Just as Jesus is the light of the world, so we are the light of the world. We are the salt of the earth. I know what some of you are thinking. You're probably thinking, oh, pastor, I've got all kinds of flaws. At times I'm selfish. I'm an erring mortal. But you realize you've also done wonderful things. You must remember this in your lifetime. You've done things for others that are incalculable, that people will never forget. And God works through, as the Bible calls it, earthen vessels. We are all that. What Jesus does, we do. And so what is Jesus doing now? He's doing what you're doing and what you do best. There's a hymn in our hymnal called Live Out Thy Life Within Me. Many of you are familiar with that hymn. I'd like to read to you the first stanza in closing because it encapsulates what I've been saying here this morning. Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of Kings. Be thou the glorious answer to all my questionings. Live out thy life within me. In all things have thy way. I, the transparent medium, thy glory to display. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Heavenly Parent, we thank you for the privilege of being your body, your church, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. I pray that during this next week, we will at least with one event, with one act of kindness or courtesy, show that we are doing what Jesus does because he does what we do. And so may we never forget this, our elevated status, that we have been seated in the heavenly realms with Christ Jesus. I pray in his name. Amen. And so I pray that you have a good week, that you thoroughly enjoy the week as you live out Christ's life within yourself and that you never forget that you are the apple of his eye. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and